Just some great stuff there. Take your Bibles, turn to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 18. We're going to take a little bit of a break. We started out this year talking about um, uh, the five solas of Scripture and the foundations for what we as the church believe, which I think is something that uh, really we need to go through like all the time because sometimes we forget that, don't we? And so we started out there, and then we spent a lot of time in the book of Jude talking about false teachers. And we talked about the importance of biblical literacy, knowing what God's Word says. And really, the most important part of that uh, piece of that puzzle is this. How are we going to know what error is if we don't know what truth is? Right? And so when somebody says, you know what, uh, I love God, but I don't read the Bible. I can't help but think to myself, um, if you want to love God more, you're going to want to know him more. How are you going to do that being in the word of God? Okay. Uh, Let me say this. uh, When it comes to study, uh, Judy, that's not just for a Sabbath school teacher to do. right? I'm, I'm thankful our teachers study and that they are prepared and ready to go. It's not just for pastors to do. You might think, well, that's your job. Uh, Well, you know what? Being able to uh, proclaim the gospel and to proclaim the word certainly is part of of what Pastor Harold and Pastor Scott and I do. And I'm very thankful that we can do that. Uh, But you know what? Uh, It can't be a job. It has to be something that we love to do. And so I want you to know this. I, none of y'all are off the hook, okay? You want to get, get to know God more, you spend time in his word. Biblical literacy is very important. And so um, we've been talking about that uh, probably toward the first part of August. We will be starting a series in First and Second Peter, and we'll be talking about uh, more of these things. And the reason why is because it is so important and it is so prevalent in society today. And so uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that. I've already started doing some of the outlining. I promise you I will not have 22 messages out of 1 Peter uh, like we did in Ecclesiastes. Uh, but it's, it's going to be good, okay? Why do I say that? Not because of the one who delivers it, but because it's God's word. Okay, and so uh, really looking forward to that. We find ourselves here in Acts chapter 18. Uh, We want to talk about encouragement here this morning. Uh, We have just, and we're not through the pandemic yet, right? Uh, But the last couple of years has been especially difficult for all of us, Uh, some more than others. uh, We have some in our church uh, uh, that really suffered from the effects of, of the COVID-19, and, and I think of Lori and Ernie, who, uh, boy, they had it for quite a while. Uh, Scott is back there, uh, Pastor Scott. I've never heard him so quiet. Uh, he dealt with that for quite a while and is uh, uh, still coming out from that a little bit. This is a long road, right? And, and for those people that have had it, it has also affected their families. Um, families had to quarantine, families had to be apart. Those in health care, obviously, uh, a very distinct set of challenges from the rest of us when it came to not only keeping themselves safe, but keeping their families safe. Uh, if you read in the news, there were, there were many, many, many hospital staff that would be staying in the camper out in their driveway for fear they would infect their family far-reaching consequences of this pandemic. I think out of this came something else, and this is something that has always been prevalent. Maybe we don't think about it as much, um, but out of this, while there were some good things that came out of it, and, and we'll be talking about that in a few weeks, while there were some good things that came out of it, one of the things that people battled the most and that I got so many phone calls about, not just from folks here, but from other pastors and people I know, was the impending sense of discouragement that came 
Uh, did you know that we were created to be social beings? We were created to be around each other. Are you ready for this? You need me. <laughs> and I need you. And yet there was a time where we weren't able to do that. You know, we as a church, uh, we were closed for about three months. That was the most difficult three months I think I've ever had. Why? We were not able to meet together. And technology is a wonderful thing, but there is no substitute for being able to be in God's house together. No substitute for that at all. There are other parts of the country uh, that were shut down just like we were. Massachusetts uh, was shut down. Uh, Karen went over there during the pandemic. I wasn't sure they were going to let her back. It's just a thing, right? Discouragement hits, and discouragement hits hard. How does it hit? Well, uh, we have the issues of, of churches not meeting. We have the legality of that even. Uh, we also have uh, loss of jobs. We have seen that over and over again. Now we have the reverse. We can't get enough people to work. That's another thing, right? Uh, we have loss of health, loss of loved ones. That can bring a lot of discouragement our way. And, and let me say this, that uh, Satan would like no more than to label discouragement as pandemic number one right now after everything that we've been through. I think it's very important that we understand uh, that discouragement is a real thing. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if I ask how many people have been discouraged over the last couple of years through all of this, my guess is a lot of hands would go up. Here, I'll raise mine, okay? Because I'm no different than y'all. We have all been to that point. There are pastors that are resigning their churches left and right because they're tired. There are pastors that are resigning their churches because physically, mentally, and emotionally, they are spent. Okay? Um, that's happening with Seventh-day Baptists as well. We have had several that have done that. And there are Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches that right now are looking for pastors. Why? Because they're just, they're just tired. They're burned out. And it's because of everything that came just like y'all, everything that just came like this. So I want to address discouragement a little bit. Uh, there were several reasons uh, that Paul was discouraged in his ministry and I want us just to look at these briefly. Uh, the first one was the large strain of the work. The large strain of the work. Uh, Paul, here in Acts chapter 18, he comes to the largest and the most wicked city in Greece. Uh, sitting high above the city of Corinth was the temple of Aphrodite. Uh, she was the goddess of love. And if you remember your history, uh, the culture back then didn't believe in the one true God. There were multiple gods. There were multiple gods. There was wicked sexual immorality there at Corinth. There was much work to be done, and the largeness of that work is discouraging. There is much to do in a culture that does not want you to do it. Secondly, little success in the work. Little success in the work. We can, now we can say that it is required of us to be found faithful and we leave success up to God, correct? We are told to do that. How often do we do that? Can I tell you who is the absolute worst at this? Let me tell you who's the worst. Are you ready? It's us pastors. We're really bad at this, and let me tell you why. There are so many pastors uh, that use the, uh, the metric of success as how many people are there for a service at any given time. Little success. You might say, 
Well, you're not supposed to be that way. And I agree with you a million percent, and I have preached that. But you know what? That is a very easy trap for many people to fall into. And you know what? Paul saw the largeness of the work, and he saw some success. But very often, how we measure success is going to be very different than how God measures it. Wouldn't it be the best thing if we all used a God's measuring stick instead of our own? I have always said we, you know, uh, it's hard to minister to an empty seat. It doesn't listen. It doesn't snore, so that's good. But it just, it's just there. How great it is to be able to minister to a person that is in a seat. How great is it when the phone rings and you're able just to talk and share on the phone? Uh, you've often heard me say, if the light's on, the coffee pot is on, you all come, right? Many of you have done that. I'm thankful for that. I, I look forward to that. Success isn't measured by how many people are there on a Sabbath morning. Rather, it's measured by growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. But yet, we often don't look at it that way. Finally, uh, the lonely service. You know what? Very often, serving Christ can be lonely. Did you know that? It really can. Paul did a lot of work alone. Or he was just with one or two people at his side and they were just traveling and they were doing this and doing that. Very often, serving God can be a lonely place. Put yourself in Paul's shoes for a moment. There were some things that Paul would see or would talk to people about and Paul's not able to share all of that. And that can be a very lonely place to find yourself. That can be discouraging. Just as the pandemic was very discouraging for those of us that are people, uh, people, 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 persons, you know what I mean. You want to be around people and you can't. Whew, dodge that one. Uh, you want to be around people, you can't. Uh, that can be very discouraging. It was for so many of us. Uh, when you are serving, very often you are alone and uh, that can be a very, a very discouraging place to find yourself. But I'm very thankful for this, that while uh, the world and Satan himself tries to throw the dart of discouragement our way, uh, we certainly uh, know and understand that God is at work to encourage us and to lift us up. Aren't you thankful for that? How many of y'all just love to be discouraged 24-7? Okay, there's probably some people. Uh, I am not one of those people. I am thankful that when the world around me tries to drag me down, I have Christ who lifts me up. While the world tries to get us to quit, you know what God says? Nope, keep going. Keep going. We looked at that last week, right? Uh, Paul had a choice to make. Where am I going to go? I want to go this way, but the Holy Spirit said, no, I've already been south. I can't go west. I've already been east. I have this little path where I can go, and eventually he ends up in Troas, right? You know, he kept moving. What an encouragement it must have been for Paul. Instead of just sitting there, at least he was moving, doing something. And he went as far as he could go. Where did he end up? He ended up in Troas. One more step, and he would have been in the Aegean Sea. He wasn't going any further than where he went. He took it as far as he could go. He kept moving and found joy and encouragement in that. So I want us to look at Acts 18 just for a couple of minutes here and, and look at three encouragements to keep on going because sometimes our desire to keep on going uh, is hijacked by the sit down and do nothing. So we need to keep going. The first one we find is this, the partnership of friends. 
Friends are important. We see this in the first five verses of Acts chapter 18. It says this, After this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all of the Jews to leave Rome. He went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and he worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. What a great message to proclaim. Can I say this? Our churches need to proclaim that message. Even today, one of the greatest God-given encouragements that we have are the friends that we have made along the way, the friends that we share with today. It's always a tough thing to go it alone. Remember Silas and Timothy, they're still in Macedonia. Uh, God knew that Paul needed someone. Who was that someone? It was Priscilla and Aquila uh, who came alongside and they were able uh, to partner with Paul in several ways. It wasn't just a friendship, but there was an employment opportunity here as well, wasn't there? You know, as Aquila and Priscilla are tent makers. Hey, Paul says, so am I. And so there was a shared work that came out of that. Uh, it wasn't just a vocational work uh, in making the tents, but it was also in sharing the gospel. Let me say this. The eviction papers that Priscilla and Aquila were given by Claudius worked out to the benefit of Paul, didn't it? Because there was encouragement that came Paul's way because of that. Uh, don't ever think that when a bad thing happens that God can't use it for his good and to his glory. That happens all the time. We very often just do not see it. We understand from scripture that Paul became very close and loved Priscilla and Aquila. They were great friends. After a while, Timothy and Silas come from Macedonia. They're reunited with Paul. So now Paul has a core around him. Priscilla, Aquila, Timothy, Silas. He brings back familiar friends with encouraging news, sharing with one another. You know what? I think it's very important for us as Christians uh, to stand up for what is right, even if we're alone, amen? Uh, we need to do that, okay? I think justice demands that we do that, that we stand for biblical justice. Sometimes we're going to do that all by ourselves. We're, we're going to be just right out here, putting ourselves out there. How much easier is it if all of the sudden we have others around us that are praying for and standing up for the same cause of Christ. That's encouraging. And that's what Paul found. There were other people that came alongside him and that encouraged him in Christ. I thank God that as Karen and I have been here, uh, it's hard to believe, man, we've been here a while. You all have put up with us a long time. I don't get it. I just don't. But I'm very thankful that as God has brought us here, you know, we have been able to develop and cultivate so many wonderful friendships over the years. And can I say that is encouraging to us in ministry. That should be encouraging to you in ministry. We keep looking forward and we go forward uh, together. Secondly, we see the positive results. The positive results. Verses 5 through 8, uh, Silas and Timothy, they arrived from Macedonia. I love this. Paul was occupied with the word. Paul had other things on his mind, didn't he? 
He was putting everything that he had into the gospel, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments, and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. He left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. Now, when you're reading this, if you are reading this at home, how many of y'all have a favorite chair? That's just your place, right? In our house, uh, we have a couch, and Karen and I have assigned seating on the couch, right? So uh, when, when, you are, when you are sitting in your chair and you read something like that, that should cause you to jump up out of your chair with a shout. All of you are going, no, I can't do that. We should. Look at what it says. Many came to Christ. Many of the Corinthians believed and were baptized. What do we recall about the Corinthians? Man, what a culture. But yet here is Paul persevering. It says that he was occupied with the work to the point where he didn't let the culture affect the message and what do we see? We see people are coming to Christ. There are many people that will say, oh, I can't witness. It's just too hard. Yeah. It wasn't easy for Paul either. He was occupied, occupied with the work. In 1782, Charles Simeon was appointed pastor of Trinity Church in England. But the many in the congregation did not want him to be the pastor. They wanted someone else to be the pastor. The bishop in charge said no. Uh, Simeon will be the pastor of the church. So the bishop said that. The second thing that happened was the church split. We don't want him as a pastor. We want somebody else. And so a very small remnant went to the church that Simeon had started for years and years and years. Small church. Small church. Didn't seem like there was a whole lot going on. And it would be very easy for, for Simeon to say, you know what, it's just time to hang it up. It's time to hang it up. I see no fruit from this. What a discouraging situation. He was asked, what keeps you going? He said, well, several things. He said, first of all, God called me to minister. And he said, well, there were a lot that didn't want me as their pastor. There were a few that did, and I focused on them. And I ministered to them, and I met their needs, and I shared to Christ with them. There was no remedy for this, he said, except for faith and patience. He kept going on and on. Here's the lesson we draw out of that. You know, so very often we are very quick to draw on the negative, aren't we? You know what? That seems to be an easy thing to do, right? It's so easy just to, just to find the negative and to set up shop there and to never, ever leave there. Did you know that a coin has two sides? Isn't that great? Just think, we would never know who was going to kick off in the football game if it only had one side. A coin has two sides. There is always several ways of looking at something. Uh, here's what it's called. It's called perspective. We are able to look at something from different points of view. Let me encourage you. It would be very easy at times to camp out in the negative camp and just to stay there. How come? Because there's a lot of people that are there and that stay there. 
And boy, uh, negativity feeds off negativity, right? It just does. Ah, oh, drives me batty sometimes. Just drives me up the wall. We are never called to live in negativity. Okay? You might say, well, you don't know what I've been through. Well, I do know what God can bring you out of. And so very often we find ourselves camped there instead of looking at the grace of God and saying, you know what? Uh, I may not be able to do this on my own, but I have God with me. God is not on my side. I'm on his. And when we look at it that way, it takes us out of the negative and we focus on we focus on how God can work in a situation. Sometimes we live in discouragement and we're not called to do that. You know what? We all make trips there from time to time, but can I encourage you? Don't stay there. Don't stay there. Why is it that we don't have to stay there? Because uh, in Verses 9 through 11, it talks about the promises of God. The promises of God. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. Why? For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. He stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. While it's true that we draw great strength and encouragement from others, uh, there is no better place to go for encouragement than God himself. God says to speak and don't be silent. And then he gives this promise. He says this, I am with you. I am with you. Aquila and Priscilla may not be there. Silas and Timothy may have gone. There may be no earthly presence there at well, but Paul did have the presence of God with him, just as we do today. What a great promise that we find in the word of God. I am with you. Don't you find great comfort and joy in that? Knowing that God is there? That's, yeah? Okay, all right. Might have to take out somebody's pulse. I don't know. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to know that. It's a wonderful thing to know that God is with us. Can I say that should also be a very humbling thing? That should be a very sobering thing? There is nothing that we can do that escapes Almighty God. Nothing. And here we have the promise of God's presence. What an encouragement that is. Another promise is made that no one will hurt you. There is divine protection there. He is present, but he is also there to protect. They tried that. In verses 12 through 17, they tried to come against Paul. But it all came to nothing, and the matter was dismissed. We also know this. There were times where Paul was run out of town on a rail, right? People did not always respond kindly to his message. And let me just say this. They didn't respond kindly to the message that Jesus had either, right? So let me encourage you. Um, if they didn't respond well to Jesus, they will not respond well to you. You just need to know that going in. You need to expect that. Scripture says that. There's a third promise that is here. It's not just presence and protection, but there is a promise of power there. God says, I have much people in this city. What does that mean? It means that there were people there that went from being dead to being alive. That's power. That is a gospel power that is present there. You see, that's what biblical preaching does. It's not the preaching that saves people. Preaching is the avenue by which the gospel comes. 
And there were people that heard and responded to the gospel. And we know that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. There's power there. There were those there that were saved by the power of God. We serve a mighty God. We, we sing that song sometimes, what a mighty God we serve. Yeah. Uh, I love that little chorus. Because we do. And, and it's absolutely right. Friends are great encouragers, and results are encouraging as well. But when God comes to you and promises you his presence, his protection, and his power, you have every reason not to sit back, but rather to move forward and to keep going. Here's a few weeks ago, uh, Karen and I, I'll tell you what, we are part of the animals. I don't know if you know that. We, we, made, a, we made a trip. We, we took a trip. It was a very long and arduous journey. We went to our backyard. And we decided we were going to have a fire in the fire pit because we have one of those. It doesn't get used near often enough, but we decided we were going to do it. So, so we did it. And we went out there, and we, Karen is a fire bug, and she got the fire going. And we had just a, a, a fire out there, sat around, and just thoroughly enjoyed it. It was fantastic. It was great. You know what? Uh, pretty soon, uh, it was getting time to call it a day. And so uh, Karen uh, started getting stuff in, and I was just kind of watching the fire, and I had a little bit of iced tea, I think, left in my glass. And, and there was just a few hot spots. I was just going to put that out. I couldn't help but know this. There was this one hot spot, and I'm not sure it didn't like me. Uh, I would pour the liquid on there, and it would kind of make this spewing noise and kind of smoke, but then it would start right up again. Isn't that frustrating? I, I am man. I can put fire out. I cannot. I certainly tried. It kept on burning. And so I just sat there. There was more there to keep it going than there was to put it out. There was something in there that kept it burning. You know, I thank God that while there is much to discourage us and to cause us to quit, there's more to encourage us and to keep going. Can I say I thank God for the partnership that we have here not just in this church, but within the kingdom of God. To share Christ, to encourage others, and to keep moving forward. Pandemics come and go. Hopefully they keep on a going. Discouragement comes and goes. Hopefully that keeps on moving away from us. We are moving away from it. God uses us together to encourage the body of Christ. Loving Father God, we are indeed thankful for the promises that we have in your word. Father, you don't leave when the going gets tough. You protect us as, as we go through those times. And Father, you, one of the ways you protect us is through the encouragement that we receive, not just from each other, but from the gospel. And Father, we're thankful that as we look into the Corinthian church, even in a culture that was so ungodly, we find ourselves in that exact same place today. Uh, nothing has changed in that regard. Father, help us to be strong and to encourage one another. Father, to share the gospel and to look to you and to be thankful for your presence, your protection, your power. And we count it all joy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.